A family that prays for one another. A family that seeks to do good and not harm. A family that encourages and builds up. We need one another. For you called us into community. You called us to build up one another, encourage one another. Your word says they shall know us by the love we show one for another. So God, thank you for reminding us that we need to pray for one another and love one another. We thank you for you are just that type of God that you demonstrated love, not just with your words, but in the fact that you sent your only begotten son who gave his life for us. So God, we love you. It's because of him that we are family. Now God, we ask right now that as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear your word, we ask that you would open up our minds that we might have understanding. Open up our hearts, God, that they might be transformed. God, we just thank you right now. We pray that a soul might be saved and a heart might be changed. We thank you for we need you to survive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Give God a hand of praise for these men folk. Amen, amen, amen. We praise God for for the brothers, amen, the brothers. And uh, I was dressed like them today, but I, mean, I was scared of that mic, amen. <laughs> Especially when they came out into the, you know, into the crowd. Like, all right, just keep walking, keep singing. Amen, amen, amen. But we praise God uh, for your presence. Amen, amen. So uh, turn with me to First Peter. We're in chapter 2, and we're going to resume our series in Peter, Hope and Glory, amen. 1 Peter chapter 2, amen. 1 Peter chapter 2, focus your attention on verses 9 and 10, 9 and 10. Amen. 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 The Word of God says this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. See, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Mercy. Amen. Amen. Just take this subject for a moment. Chosen. Chosen. One word. Chosen. Amen. And if it's one thing that you, one takeaway you get from this morning, I want us to realize as Christians, we have a new identity. Amen. And a new family. Because we are chosen. Amen. We are chosen. It's interesting in this day and age in America that we are faced with this movement that on the surface seems like it's right on point, amen? With the advent of smartphones and immediate availability of video recording, many Americans have been exposed to a world that they either ignore, amen, or that they did not know existed, Amen. In that world, things were, are, are not always what they seem to be, and, and what is presented as right is not always so, amen? With the death of Michael Brown in Ferguson and the homicide of Walter Scott in South Carolina, these became the flashpoints for the movement called Black Lives Matter. Amen. Black Lives Matter. The, the interesting part is that, yes, uh, police brutality and abuse has to be exposed on all levels. Amen. I'm straight out of Compton. I can tell you many, many stories, and I carry a badge every single day and a gun. Amen. And I can tell you stories that if they had video cameras back then and smartphones, I'd be a very rich man. Amen. 
But, but it's interesting that, that those things do have to be exposed. However, the greater, greater issue is that all lives matter to God. Amen? And if all lives matter to God, then that means that for us as believers, all lives have to matter to us. Amen? Listen, just the other day in Texas, as a sheriff deputy was uh, fueling up his vehicle at the gas station, some man walks behind him and kills him senselessly. Amen? A few weeks ago, in the city of Highland, a, a little boy, four years old, out playing in the yard, amen, catches a stray bullet and is killed. But I don't see uh, the movement for law enforcement lives matter. I don't see a movement for the brown lives matter. Amen. The movement we need to be concerned with as believers is that all lives matter to God. All lives are important. All lives are valuable to God. To God, life is valuable. Life is so valuable that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem it, to reconcile it, to save it. Amen. All life matters in God's eyes. Life is valuable and precious. Listen, as we uh, resume our series in 1 Peter, Hope and Glory, we must remember that as the Apostle Peter penned his letter, amen, he was writing to a group that was uh, uh, not very valued by their persecutors, amen. He was writing to uh, a church that had been dispersed, amen, and they were under persecution through Roman rule. Some of them were losing their lives because of their faith. Some of them faced uh, uh, just excruciating persecution. They just weren't talked about. They were beat upon. They were fed to lions. They were set on fire. Amen? Because of their faith. But Peter is writing to remind them that their life matters. Amen? They were being persecuted for their faith, but he wanted to tell them that their life had value. Amen? In 1 Peter, along with the themes of hope and glory, and that we have been given a living hope through Christ, we often find Peter reminding his readers that suffering is part of the package. Amen. I know that, that many of us in, in, in the Western church are under this illusion that, that when you come to Christ that, that everything is good and everything is wonderful. That when you surrender to Christ, they're going to roll down, rose petals down the aisle. Amen. Your life is going to smell good. All your problems will be fixed. Amen. Nobody not going to mess with you no more. They don't love you on your job. They don't love you in your family. Everything's going to be fixed because you're with Jesus. Amen. That broke down the lock you got it. You just have faith. You'll have a Mercedes. That broken down house you may live in. You got a big mansion coming. All you have to do is have faith. Amen. That bad diagnosis you, you have, it's your fault because you don't have enough faith. But if you have faith, you'll be healed. Let me tell you, that's a lot. Right. Suffering is a part of the package, amen. And suffering helps us to understand who God is. And if Christ suffered, who are we to think that we will not suffer, amen? We find Peter reminding them that again, suffering is part of the package. And even in the midst of suffering, we're called to be holy. Wow. Amen. You remember when we started off this journey in 1 Peter, hope and glory, we, we learned that we must be holy, for he is holy. Amen. And we learned that the only way we can truly be holy is to be obedient to God's word. See, Peter reminded the listeners that God often used suffering to refine us, to grow us, to develop our faith. Amen? To develop a dependence on him. One assurance that the believer has in Christ is that we are special to God. <laughs> Amen? I don't, I, don't, I don't know about you, but, but it feels good to know that I am special to God. Amen? We are the chosen. Amen? We've been designated as his special possession. Contrary to popular belief, all human beings are not God's children. Amen. I know that, that folk, everybody want to claim to be a child of God, but everybody's not his child. Mankind is God's creation, but that does not mean that you are his child. 
Being a child denotes that you have relationship with him. Romans 8, 14 through 17 tells us this. All those led by God's spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Amen. That's like crying out, Daddy. That is a term of intimacy, a term of endearment. Amen. The, the Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if God's children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. See, it's a privilege to be God's child. It's a privilege to be chosen. Amen. When I think about being chosen, Think about the fact, many of us grew up in neighborhoods where, you know, we played pickup games. We played a little basketball, a little baseball, a little football, amen. And, and if you look like uh, uh, Terrell Sales or, or if you look like Brian or something and you needed football, they usually don't have to worry about getting cho chosen. Right, 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 right. Amen. They, they, the, 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 the ones that at least appear to have the ability, amen, they, they're going to get chosen, Amen. And then we know there's a, a pecking order. And then you gotta go down. And, and then when it comes to the end and you you looking at the brothers you don't want to choose, you just like some more gonna appear. You're like, oh. it's your it's, it's your choice, right? You gotta pick. No, no, you gotta pick. You're like, I, I gotta take him. Well, yeah, I gotta take him. And you, you tell the brother, come on, man, be on my team. But I praise God, he doesn't choose that way. And when, when God chooses, he doesn't choose based on your ability, amen? He doesn't choose based on what you look like or what things appear to be. He chooses based on the fact that he loves you, amen? Listen, he took those who seemed like they were downtrodden, broken. Listen, the apostles weren't some sophisticated men who came out of seminary. They didn't study under the best rabbis, amen. He called fishermen. He called the hated tax collectors, amen. He called Moses a murderer, amen. He called David, who was the shepherd boy, who, who was not even chosen, amen. But God chose him. He was not man's choice, but God chose him. So it feels good to be chosen. And see, when you're chosen, you're chosen at the exclusion to others. Because everybody doesn't get chosen. Amen. So to be chosen by God, it, it makes you valuable. Amen. Listen, if you had a pair of Air Jordans that you went down to Foot Locker and, and bought, they may be valuable, a couple hundred bucks. But let them be a pair of Air Jordans that his airness actually wore. The shoes didn't change. The value of the shoes didn't change based on the, the thing that it was. It was based on the relationship. So if you wear Air Jordans that were worn by his heirs, amen, the value of those shoes would be increased. Amen? And so here it is. Because we belong to God, our value is increased. Our value is priceless. Amen? Our value is immeasurable. Matter of fact, it was measured. Out on Calvary. Amen? By Jesus Christ himself. Amen? In 1 Peter, uh, this distinction of the chosen, that new identity comes to light. Amen? We take on a new identity in Christ. We have a new family. Amen? Amen. Often I find it interesting, the brotherhood of fraternities and the sisterhood of sororities. Amen? From the outside looking in, it clear, it's clear to see a common bond that each of these groups Shares, amen? amen. The bond is not based on their economic background or even their familial bounds. It is a shared experience, a shared value system, a set of beliefs that maintains that the, the ties between the brothers and the sisters. Amen? amen. They belong to something greater than themselves. Amen. amen. And some of them take it to the extreme. Uh, like my, my brother-in-law, Deidre's uh, little brother, amen, where he, he's an Omega and he used to wear a purple diaper. <laughs> amen. I know he ain't listening to the tape so I feel safe. Amen. <laughs> 
They share a value system that some of us don't understand. Amen? But it binds them together. <laughs> Listen, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we share a common value system that supersedes all man-made affiliations. Right. Because of our relationship with Christ, we have a new identity. Right. We belong to a new family. Amen? Right. Listen, I remember... When my wife became a Delta. Oh, Lord. I strolled up on uh, Cal State. The meetings is happening. She went to Cal State Northridge. And so me and my boys rolled up to a party. Amen. And she had just became a Delta. And she was with her sisters. And they were doing their thing. The party was on. Amen. And, and you know, and I was like, hey, you know, you look a little different the last time I seen you. What's going on? And she just went on about her business. She said hi or whatever, but she was so excited about her new sisterhood. She didn't give her brother a time of day. <laughs> oh, but a few months later, amen, she would have a bond with me that superseded Delta and everything else, amen? My, my point is that, that when we are standing, <laughs> A common bond. Oh, right. Keep it we become a family. Amen. She had new sisters. She had a new world, a new reality, a new family. She wasn't thinking about no brother like me. Amen. But little did she know she was going to get a new family with me. Amen. But listen, we must, just like my wife, embrace the new brotherhood and sisterhood we have in Christ. We must recognize that we are chosen by God and we're special to him. We're special, amen? We have to remember as Christians, we have a new identity, a new family. We are chosen, amen? Listen, in the opening verses of 1 Peter chapter 2, we find Peter outlines our new identity in Christ. He gives us a glimpse of the special value we have because of our relationship to Christ. See, that value is because we are chosen. Check out what it says in, in these opening verses of chapter 2. It says this, So rid yourselves of all wickedness, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander, like newborn infants desire the unadulterated spiritual milk so that you may grow by it in your salvation since you have tasted that the Lord is good. Mm. See, when we talk about this fact that we have a new identity, a new family, we must understand that we have to grow up. See, spiritual growth is fueled by an appreciation of God's grace. When we look at this opening section, it logically flows out of the previous chapter where God was reminding us that we need to be holy. Where God was reminding us we need to be obedient to his word. Amen? Amen? Some of your versions open up with therefore. We know that therefore points us back. Amen? See, the subject here is the word of God. The word of God was the content of Peter's preaching. See, the life-changing power of the word must affect our lives as Christians. See, reborn children of God should exhibit their new life in their day-to-day -day living. Amen? Amen? Believers have to exhibit a different quality of life marked by a continuous growth in his word. Amen? Amen? Listen, when we look at this fact, he tells us newborn babies, like newborn babies. When we look at those newborn babies, he's not talking about the fact that gee, they are brand new believers. Just like a brand new baby desires milk. Have you, some of you guys are parents. Amen. All the baby, when he wants milk, he don't care what you're doing. <laughs> he don't care that you got other stuff to do. The, the baby doesn't, doesn't care that, you know what, I, I got to go and do this. I gotta do. The baby wants milk and they want milk right now. So us as believers, God says that we need to crave God's word. Just like newborn babes, amen? He reminds us that when we talk about the fact that we are newborn babes, listen, he tells us some stuff we need to get rid of. 
And see, many of us don't want to get rid of this stuff. See, these verses list five sins that are of attitude and speech that we must let go. Amen? See, we can't thirst after God's word. We can't follow God's word. We can't hear God's voice. We can't get the pure milk of the word if we are holding on to some things. Amen? Amen. There's some stuff that we got to get rid of. Amen? Listen, the first thing he tells us that we got to get rid of is malice. And malice has to do with attitude. Amen? It's an attitude similar to hatred and it is the desire to inflict pain, harm, or injury on another person. And listen, in the church, most of the harm is not physical that we plan to inflict. We inflict spiritual, mental pain to people, and we do it with malice. That means you got evil intentions. Everybody who comes to church don't have your best interests in hand. Everybody that say, hey, can you come pray with me? Don't have your best interests in, in mind. Everybody who hop on the prayer line and say, listen, we need to be praying for sister such and such and brother such and such. Don't have their best interests in mind. Malice, evil intentions. Then he says, get rid of deceit. It refers to deliberate dishonesty. To speaking or acting with ulterior motives. Any le anything less than speaking the full and honest truth from the heart is deceit. See, when we look at this vice, it is selfish at the roots. Amen. Two-faced attitudes that deceive and hurt others for personal gain. Two-faced. Amen. Two-faced. And that plays right into the next one. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy has an intriguing, intriguing history. When we look at hypocrisy, it, it ultimately described an actor. See, because when you act, you put on another face. You're presenting something else. See, but some hypocrites don't have a sad card. <laughs> Amen. They just not acting on film. They, their life is a fake and a phony. Their life is a persona. Amen. I, I know that some folk, and I've said this before, they don't want to come to church because they're hypocrites there. Amen. And, and please come to church because you just don't join the crowd. There are hypocrites here. Because like I shared before, all of us got a little bit of hypocrite in us. The thing is, as we grow in our relationship with Christ, he tries to help us understand who we are in him. You don't think you're a hypocrite? I guarantee you all of us don't act the same way we act on the job as we do on Sunday. You don't act the same way you act in your house as you act on your job. We all wear a mask. I think my wife shared that with the women a few weeks ago. We all wear a mask. The point is that as we grow in Christ, we want to be as authentic as possible. And some of us don't even know we're wearing a mask and God has to show us that you act right. And some of us ain't acting right. Amen? Not only do we need to get rid of that hypocrisy, we need to get rid of envy. Envy has no place among believers, amen? Envy begins on a desire to possess what belongs to someone else. See, but it is more than this. It is a resentful discontent. See, envy is the feeling of displeasure produced by witnessing or hearing of the advantage or prosperity of others. See, this is at the root of hateration. Amen? The folk that have envy, they've been sipping on haterade. Amen? They see what you got. Not only do they see what you got and want what you got, they hate you because you got. They don't understand the, that God blesses who he wants to bless. Amen? That you got your own blessings. You don't have to have what I have. God has something especially for you. Why are you hating on me? Talk to your daddy. He got something special for you. You don't have to have what I have, amen? Matter of fact, you may not want to go through what I have to go through with you. Don't envy. Don't envy. And lastly, he tells them, get rid of slander of every kind. See, this is interesting. See, this final behavior attitude that Peter mentions in verse 1, slander literally means to speak against someone. 
It suggests running others down verbally. It is a speech that deliberately assaults the character of other persons. It is any speech that harms another person's status or reputation. See, when we talk about slander, see, it's not slander if you're a dog and you're dogging out folk and I warn that person that, hey, that person's a dog. I'm not slandering because that is true. Now, slander of someone is taking what you hear as gossip or in your window or what you think and, 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 and slandering their name, giving evil intentions to their name, running their name in the ground. See, in the, in, 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 uh, in the world, if you slander someone, they have legal recourse. You know that, right? You just can't say what you want to say about somebody, especially public figures in a public forum, amen? There's legal recourse to that. We as the church should not be slandering our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Matter of fact, if you know something and it is true, what you need to be doing is praying about it. We need to be building up each other. We need to be encouraging one another. Listen, Peter was confronted by Paul. Paul was not slandering Peter because he was telling Peter, brother, you're being a hypocrite. See, you were out here uh, hanging out with the Gentiles, enjoying meals with them, and then when James and his crew came, the super Jews, Christians came, all of a sudden you wanted to distance yourself from them. See, when, when Peter was called out, Paul was not slandering him. Paul was speaking the truth. He was confronting his hypocrisy. See, when it comes to slander, you're not confronting truth. You're seeking to harm someone's reputation. He tells us we need to get rid of that. We need to start seeking the, the, the unadulterated spiritual milk, amen, that we might grow by it. And then he tells us that you have tasted and seen that, the God, that God is good. See, if you truly had a taste of God's goodness, it should set up a thirst for you. Amen? Now, uh, uh, Mr. Orlando, who, who is not in here, he often blames, oh, uh, there he is, blames uh, me for uh, uh, getting him addicted to Coke Zero. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But he tasted and saw that Coke Zero was good. And, and what it did is it set up a desire in him that any time he has a thirst in those little black hands around, that he thirsts for Coke Zero. See, many of us, God has given us his grace, and we've tasted his mercy, we've tasted his love, we've tasted his forgiveness, and it should set up a thirst in us to come after him. It should set up a thirst in him that no matter what, I, I need more of that. Where can I get, preacher, where can I get more of that? Teacher, where can I get more of that? Where can I find that? I, I need that, amen? It's hard to win. When I look at the fridge and there's no Coke Zero in there, I say, hey, baby, I'm about to go to the store. I'm looking at the time that it could be midnight. Sometimes. But are we doing that for God's work? Are we so thirsty that, that we're, we're willing to do whatever it takes? Amen. You, you going up to that church house again? I'm thirsty. Right. You going to that Bible study again? Oh, oh, oh I'm thirsty. Right. Hey, you still pray? I'm thirsty. Hey, I, oh, you going and you doing that? You serving? Yeah, I'm, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. I'm trying to get all I can because I'm thirsty. I know young people, y'all call thirsty something else, but I'm talking about a good thirst. Are you thirsty? See, when you're chosen, when you understand who God is, when you're like that newborn babe chasing after that milk, you have to be thirsty for God's word. Amen? See, none of these practices that Peter talks about should have any place in God's chosen people. See, in obedience to the command of God, believers are to rid themselves of all those type of attitudes and actions. Amen? Amen. We are to seek him because we have tasted that the Lord is good. Amen? As Christians, we have a new identity and a new family. 
because we are chosen. So not only do we need to make sure that we grow up, but we got to grow up together. Amen. I love the, that song. I, I tease about that song that the brother sang. I call it the Barney song. Y'all, some of y'all know Barney, that purple dinosaur. You know, you know the Barney song. I love you. You love me. Amen. We, 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 I call that the Barney song because it, it's a simple song. I love you. You love me. We're all part of God's family. Amen. His body. Amen. Pray with me, right? Agree with me. See, listen, we are all part of the body of Christ. And when we grow, we just don't grow individually. We need to grow together. We are God's family. Listen to what the verses say in verses 4 through 8. It says this, Coming to him a living stone, rejected by men, but chosen and valuable to God. You yourselves, as living stones, are being built into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ for it is contained in scripture look I lay a stone in Zion a chosen and honored cornerstone and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame so honor will come to you who believe but for the unbelieving the stone that the builders rejected this one has become the cornerstone and a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they disobeyed the message. They were destined for this. See, Christians, we must grow together, not just as individuals, but as living stones. When we're joined together with other believers, we become an integral part of God's building and his spiritual house. See, this is an important building block for us to understand that we are the chosen. Amen? Here we find Jesus speaking of the, uh, Peter writing the fact that Jesus is the living stone. See, when we talk about Jesus as the stone, he is a living stone. He is not dead. We went to the Dead Sea Scrolls on yesterday. And they had a stone there that was a part of the wailing wall. And when you touch that, that stone is cold and strong. And you think about the centuries that that stone has been able to endure. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Uh, uh, Layton is a contractor. Anything that's built with stone, it has to have a stone that is the chief cornerstone that everything is built out on. Amen. Jesus is the stone that the church is built on. He is the chief cornerstone. That cornerstone that was rejected, amen? But that rejected stone became the most valuable stone. And because he was that rejected stone, he became a living stone, the foundation of his church. And then he told us that we are now living stones. When we look at a new stone that's added, we are building up the body of Christ. We are building up this spiritual building, the church. All of us are a important part of the church. God wants us all to fit together, amen, so that we may be a strong spiritual building. Listen, when we look at the scripture, the decision to believe in Jesus Christ admits an individual into God's spiritual building program. That when we give our life to Christ, we become an integral part of what God is doing. See, here he first introduces us to the, to the phrase that we are a holy priesthood. All believers are priests. Every Christian has an immediate and direct access to to God through Jesus Christ and serves God personally by bringing others to God. We are all part of God's work. I, you don't have to wear a collar. Amen. You don't have to uh, have somebody come into a little room and confess to you. We are all God's priests. Amen. We are all those that God has given the caring to, of the gospel into our hands to go out and share God's goodness. Amen? Listen, a priest offers spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. 
My question is, what are your spiritual sacrifices? See, in the Old Testament, it speaks of spiritual sacrifices of prayer and thanksgiving and praise and repentance. The New Testament goes even further. By identifying spiritual sacrifices as the offering of our bodies to God for his service. The offering of our financial gifts and the practical loving service to other people. <laughs> See, spiritual sacrifices in the New Testament involve our bodies, our money, and our time. So when you come to Christ as the living stone, you become a part of a building, the church. See, your growth begins to speak for itself as you offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. I shouldn't have to ask you, are you giving to God? Are you a living sacrifice? I should be able to see the sacrifice. Amen? And not just don't talk about service, be about service. Amen? It should, don't just talk about how much you love somebody, show them that you love Amen? This is action oriented. We must be those living sacrifices. Amen? He said, I lay a, a stone in Zion, a, a chosen, valuable cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Paul writes in Romans, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the very power of salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Listen, when you follow God, you don't ever have to worry about being put to shame. Now, in the world's eyes, you may have something to be shameful about. But in God's eyes, no matter what you, if you're obedient to what he's called you to do, no matter what it might look like to the world, you are pleasing and acceptable in his sight. Amen? See, and he tells us for those who rejected this stone, it becomes a stumbling block. It becomes a rock that they trip over. Amen. You can proclaim the word, and if they reject who God is, it becomes a stumbling block for them. Oh, I don't understand why you got to go to that church. I don't understand why you got to serve a Jesus. You ain't never seen what Jesus did for you. See, it's a stumbling block for you because you reject it. You don't have ears to hear. You don't have a heart to, to understand. Amen. Because the, the, the enemy is hardening your heart. Then we find out from our verse here, our scripture verse, that we have a new identity. We have a new family. For we are chosen. Listen to this in the New Living Translation. Verse 9 and 10 says this, but you are not like that, uh, like those who rejected him. Like those that don't understand who he is. For you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. A holy nation. God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy... Now you have received God's mercy. The description we see here of the church in these verses parallels to God's description of Israel in Exodus 19 verses 5 through 6 and also in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7 verse 6. In contrast to the disobedient and rebellious nation of Israel, God's people today are chosen and a holy nation. This does not suggest that God is through with Israel. Amen. Don't get it twisted. We, we don't replace Israel. God is not done with them. But he's told us, he's telling us now that you are chosen. See, Israel, that was a bragging point for them. In all the old, old Testament, God says, you are my chosen people. But this is the rub. They weren't chosen because they were so wonderful. They weren't chosen because they, they, they were a, a, a great stature. They weren't chosen uh, because they had great pedigree. They were chosen because God chose them by his grace and his mercy. They were chosen because of God's love. Amen. He, they were God's chosen people. Now in the New Testament, we find out that we are chosen by God. See, sometimes it, there's a danger. There's a danger. Sometimes when we read the Old Testament and we see how God uh, uh, dealt with his people in the Old Testament, we have a tendency to look back on them and say, well, I'd never do that. 
You know, and look, he, if he parked the Red Sea in front of me, I'm good. I'm all the way. Whatever you say, Lord, I'm rolling with you. But he's parted some Red Seas in your life. He's done some things in your life. Amen. And yet, soon as he finished, you, you fuck it. Oh, it used to be good back over there when I was doing this. Uh, I, uh, before I stopped following the Lord, I had a better job over here. I was making more money. You forgot that you was on dope. You forgot that you were addicted to alcohol. You forgot that you was in a broken relationship. You forgot that you were in the devil's deed. But see, sometimes when we get delivered and our, our eyes get a little clear, we, we lose perspective. We forget. See, just like Israel, they forget. They hadn't even been out of Egypt long before they was, hey, uh, Aaron, can you build us a God that we can serve? Can you build us a God? Wait a minute, you just built that God, and then you say the God that you just built, thank you for bringing us out of, uh, out of Egypt? That God wasn't even there. God brought you out. And many of us, we do just like that. We rebel and we get stiff neck and we forget it was God that brought us out of the darkness into the marvelous light. We are a chosen generation. That speaks to the fact that we are chosen by God's grace. God did not choose us because we were so wonderful. He chose us as a result of his love. I love Jesus when the fact they were they were kind of swelling up a little bit and, and, and Jesus tell them, listen, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Yeah. You know, many of us, yeah, yeah, you know what? I, I, I went and I decided and elected to follow Christ. Christ, hold up. I chose you. I lavished my love on you. You couldn't even come to me unless I beckoned to you. You, you couldn't even come to me unless I empowered your feet. Amen. To, to walk toward. You couldn't even understand who I am unless I shine a little light on your mind. Amen. You didn't choose me. I chose you. It, it feels good to be chosen, y'all. Feels good to be chosen. Then he not only tells us that we are a chosen generation, he says you are a holy nation. See, holiness, as we learned a few weeks ago, denotes that we've been set apart. Amen. We, we've been set apart. He, he took us and, and separated us. He said, you to be different. You to be distinct. Amen. Uh, when we look at our lives as believers, if we stand up against the world, if, they put, if Christ put us up in a lineup, and they walked us in the room, and, 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 and Peter says, um, um, can you tell me the, the holy guy? Can you, can you show me uh, who's the holy one in, in the crowd? And if they're looking, I can't identify him. That's the problem. See, when we are, are in a lineup against the world, they should be able to look at us and say, that's the one. Amen. That's the one I saw. How he showed love for the unlovable. That's the one I saw him visiting those in the hospital. Oh yeah, that's the one. I saw him go visit those that were in jail. Oh, that's the one who fed the homies. That's the one who, who hugged those that nobody else wanted to hug. No, that's the one. So are you readily identifying? He says we are a holy nation. Our citizenship is in heaven. Amen. So we are to obey heaven's laws and seek to please heaven's Lord. Amen? Are you walking around with your heaven identification card? Are you too busy trying to lose your ID so you can blink? If I went to your workplace and said, hey, do you know such and such? They go to, go to my church. Church? <laughs> Are you going to church? <laughs> what do you mean? We're a holy nation to be set apart different. Amen? We are special and distinct. God commanded them to be different. That there be a difference between the holy and the unholy. Amen? We are to be holy. We are to be different. He tells us that we are the people of God. Amen. We are the people of God. Do we act like God's people? Listen, in our unsaved condition, we were not God's people because we belong to Satan and the world. 
I know we don't like to hear that. Amen. But that's that's in the word. Read Ephesians chapter 2. It'll, it'll enlighten you. Amen. I was on Satan's team before I came to Christ. And I was riding for it. Look, I know y'all won't admit it. I admit it for you. I was rolling with him. I was on his squad all in. I see y'all quiet now. <laughs> was all in. And I didn't even realize I was all in until God called me and saved me. Amen? Because God tells Jesus, lets us know very clearly. Either you with me or are you against me? See, now that we've trusted Christ, we are part of his family. We are God's people, a people of his own possession. Because he purchased us with his blood. When we look at the fact that we are God's chosen people, this royal priesthood, this holy nation, we have to understand we're living in enemy territory. You know, listen, and the enemy is constantly looking for opportunities to, 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 to kind of make us not understand who we are in Christ. He's looking for opportunities to come in and, and move in and take over. He's looking for opportunities, amen, to reject our citizenship. But we must remain united. We must understand that we're called to do this together. These, these, these terms refer to us as being part of a family. You are a nation. You are a priesthood. We are holy. We are together, amen. We are chosen. God called us. Amen. We have a new identity, a new family. When the, when the family sticks together, it is hard for the enemy to cause division. Yeah. However, when the individual members of the family don't do their part to grow in faith, to live out their faith in obedience to God's word, the enemy finds a way to step in and cause yeah. division and confusion in the family. See, we must remember we are chosen. We must remember we are valuable to God. Our lives matter. When we look at these pictures that show us how important we are to God, that show us our new identity in Christ, we have to remember that as a new family, we must seek harmony. We must seek unity. We must seek to do this thing together. Amen? We belong to one family of God and share the same divine nature. We are living stones in one building and priests serving in one temple. We are citizens of the same holy heavenly homeland. It is Christ Jesus who is the source and center of our family. Listen, without Christ, we ain't family. Without a relationship with Christ, we can't get along. Amen. I don't care what Rodney King said. He can bang all he wants. Can we all just get along? No, you can't get along without Christ. And we know that those of us who love Jesus dearly, who have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, who have a relationship with that one, know it's hard to get along. Yeah. Even in the church. But we must develop a dependence on God's strength to help us to remember that each of us are valuable. I pray for you, you pray for me, because we understand we're valuable. I won't uh, do harm with you with words from my mouth because you're valuable. I understand what Ephesians says that no unwholesome words should proceed from my mouth, but only words that for, uh, for encouragement and for the need of the moment that it may bring grace to those that hear. We as believers ought to build up each other, encourage one another, because we're family. And the world's example of family ain't our, ain't our example. And man, you know, some of us go to a family reunion, you got to bring your, your boxing shoe, your boxing uh, uh, gloves, amen. You know, and we know that don't have to bury a loved one. You almost got to bring your pistol to the funeral. So that's not the example. The example is in, in the word. God calls us to love one another, encourage one another. Listen, as I close, all of these privileges carry with them one big responsibility: revealing the praises of God to a lost world. See, when we look at, he says this in the scripture for us to show. For it means to tell out, to advertise. Amen. Listen, he tells us this. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people, right? You are God's people. He says, once you did not have mercy, but now you have mercy. And when he looks at this, points to the fact that he is the God who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. In light there is mercy. And in light there is his 
grace. We are, have the responsibility to advertise the fact that God is good. We have the fact that we must tell everybody that we that will listen to us that God sent his son to die on the cross for your sins, for my sins. There is hope and glory if we surrender our life to Christ. We're supposed to be walking billboards of God's grace, mercy, and love. Each citizen of heaven is a living advertisement for the virtues of God and the blessings of the Christian life. People look at our lives sometimes and they say, well, I don't want that. Amen? Because we've been given false advertisement. We need to show them that God has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Our lives should radiate the marvelous light, amen, into which God has graciously called us to. We're called out of darkness. Some of us know what it is to be in a dark place. But let me tell you, when it comes to darkness, light always wins. The light always wins. Amen. Light will always outshine the darkness. Amen. When we look at this, we must remember who we are in Christ. Listen, when we listen to this theologian, uh, Wayne Grudem, he says this, the answer to our search for ultimate meaning lies in declaring the excellencies of God. For he alone is worthy of glory. Salvation is ultimately not man-centered, but God-centered. To declare God's excellencies is to speak of all he is, is and has done. This purpose is too often thwarted by our silence or pride. But even brief associations with a Christian whose speech fulfills a purpose invariably refreshes our spirits. He's talking about the fact that when you encounter somebody who really loves Jesus, your spirit is refreshed. That, that light shines so bright. Let me leave you with this. The, the Bible tells us, Jesus said this, let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Listen, we're to let our light shine because Christ has brought us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. He has given us a new identity, a new family. So the question is today for me, are you living in the light? Are you living a life that reflects that you are chosen, that you are royalty, that you are holy? My challenge for us today is that as we pray, ask God to show you where you stand with him. Are you living like the chosen or rebelling against the one who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light? We are chosen. We must act like it. Amen? Amen. Give God a hand of praise. too fast and not stopping forgetting to ask where i'm going i've been crying at night in the darkness suffering alone in the silence i've been hiding the pain and the confusion forgetting who holds all solutions trying to rule the world my own way now i'm humble enough to say that 